Um, my name is Marian Duale. I am with Global Health, Education and Development, a local nonprofit organization here in Ohio. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for your patience and waiting for us to get ready and get started. This event is a collaboration between Global Health and Education and Development and Masjid Ibn Taymiyyah. Um, it's for the youth, as you can see, it's for you, uh, f from another youth. Global Health and Education and Development does, um, we provide access to health and education for immigrant communities, and mental health is one of our big projects that we focus. You all probably know our, our community and mental health and the stigma towards mental health. You probably also know there are a lot of issues in our community with alcohol, drug addiction, um, and things of that sort. We want to end the silence against these issues. We want to understand that mental health is like any other disease, and that substance misuse is also a disease. And if we do that, we're going to be able to then discuss it openly, seek treatment openly, and help each other. But if we hide this, we're gonna end, it's going to kill our kids and our people the way it's doing right now. So I'm very happy to get the masjid support and understanding and willing to engage our youth and discuss this issue. And we have for you an amazing young man, uh, Abdurrahman Warsame, and we're going to introduce him. This is his show. He's going to share his life experience with us. And the speech, there's not going to be a lot of his speech. He's going to say a few words about what he went through and his journey. And then it's going to be open discussion. You guys need to talk about what you know about your community. And we need to brainstorm of how we can make it better. So it's your event. Please feel free, please feel welcome, and please don't be shy. I'm going to welcome my daughter, Safiya Jama, to introduce Abdurrahman. Welcome, Safiya. Um, Assalamu alaikum. My name is Safiya Jama. Um, thank you guys once again for taking your, uh, the day out of your time to come here and be part of the discussion. Uh, this is really a topic that we need to talk about, especially with our, in, within our community. I would like to introduce our guest, Abdurrahman Warsame. A second generation immigrant from Somalia, he displays his vivid storytelling skills through his poetry, from the clamps of addiction to his advocacy for recovery and sobriety. Adrahman speaks on the trials he faced, the emotions he feels through his recovery, throughout his recovery, and walks us through his recovery experience. Adrahman is the co founder and executive director of Generation Hope a youth-led recovery organization in Minneapolis aimed at ending the stigma of addiction and mental health within the East African community. Adrahman is a certified recovery peer support specialist and is in school for his LADC, which is to be a licensed alcohol and drug counselor. So can we please give it up for Adrahman Warsame? Assalamu alaikum. Yeah, I don't hear it. Assalamu alaikum. How y'all doing? Y'all doing good? Everybody sound like this. Y'all got forced to be here. If you got forced to be here, you can, you know, you don't have to stay here. All right. Um, uh, so my name is Abdurrahman. Um, first and foremost, I know probably most of y'all probably don't even know me, right? But I look like you. I talk like you. Uh, probably even dressed like some of you, right? I was born and raised in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I dealt with addiction. I'm, I'm in recovery, right? I was addicted to a substance called fentanyl. I dibbled and dabbled with everything in my life, and um, what kind of really took me the most was fentanyl. Does anybody know what fentanyl is? Raise your hand. It's not bad to know what fentanyl is. I know y'all know what it is. So somebody raise your hand. You see, this is what they call stigma. Right? 
scared to speak about something even though you know it's, it's true, right? I dealt with addiction for a good period of you know, my life. And the reason why I did what I did and I came out to my community to talk about this thing, you know what I mean, with my best friend and a lot of the homies that, you know, we came out of this together was because <clears throat> it was such a bad thing that was happening. And it's not just happening, you know, in our community. It's happening all around the world. But with something that's different, you know, within the Somali community is that we don't talk about it. Right? I bet everybody in this room knows somebody that died from drug overdose. Raise your hand if you know somebody that died from drug overdose. Raise your hand. There's probably more people in this room, but you don't want to raise your hand. Right? What they say when that person died? Or they died in their sleep. Right? Or they had a heart attack. Right? Hey, boy. Right? But it's a real issue. You know, probably some people here, when I'm speaking about, you know, what I went through, they're like, oh, yeah, this dude privilege. Right? Oh, yeah, he, he probably had it easy. You know? But it's, it's half of that. And, you know, um, I'm not here to tell my story for, for support or for, you know, a shoulder to cry on. It's for a lesson. To whoever may take it. And you might take it a different way. There's probably somebody in this room that's struggling right now. Or they know somebody that's struggling right now. Right? And you could take it as a lesson to help yourself or to help somebody else. Because I bet you every single person in this room knows either somebody that's dealing with it or is headed towards that path. Right? Is that, is that something that everybody can agree on? Without being ashamed to agree on it? Right? Man, I done been shot at. Had my homie get shot right in front of me. I done OD'd. Been in the hospital. Seen my life flash before my eyes more times than I can count. And to this day, as I'm here speaking to you guys, I don't know how or why I got out of the situation that I did. What I do know, though, is that I prayed. And I tried. And it was hard. And I failed. And I tried. I didn't have a lot of support. You know? Um, one person that supported me a lot was my mother. Right? Even though she didn't know what I was going through. She didn't know. She, she didn't understand it. You know, she tried to, but she couldn't. You know, and my mom, she, she had that, you know, tough love persona. You know what I mean? Where when she seen me high, she kicked me out the crib. You know, but it got to the point where my mom feared for my life so much that she had to keep me in the house and watch me deteriorate and deteriorate. Because in a way, she was kind of enabling me, you know, but she had to. Because if I was outside, I would end up dead. And it continued on that way. The reason why me and my homies, we started this, and we spoke out in our community, which is something that's never been done before, was because we just continuously seen people dying. And you know, most of the time when people are dying in the community, it's not like just one out of nowhere, you know? Or at least how, that's how it was a couple of years ago. It would just be, boom, you know, one person die, another person die, another person die, like five within a week. It's a couple within a month. And the reason why is because there's something called the bad batch that usually goes around through a neighborhood, through a dealer, where, you know, they're, they're cooking this stuff up. And, you know, somebody messes up on the calculations, and so a bunch of people die because of it. And it's not just within the, the Somali community or any community. It's all around, whoever's buying from that dealer. And so I remember vividly, I wasn't even in Minnesota, I was in Texas, you know, and one week after another, closer and closer, it was hitting home until a really close friend of mine, you know, who, who was in recovery with me, you know, and he got sober two months before I did, and he was really there for me when I first kind of started on that journey, 
you know, he ended up dying. He ended up coming back. He was gone from Minnesota, and he ended up coming back. And Allah, yarhamu, he passed. And it broke me. And it just continued getting worse. I had friends, family members that were going through the same thing. And no matter where I looked, nobody was speaking about it. And I go around, I've, I've traveled a lot. I've been to a lot of different states. I've been to a lot of different communities. And this is something that's similar alike all around. I mean, a young brother was just telling me just a little bit ago that there was like a 15-year-old brother that just died to gun violence, right? And that's something that happens a lot probably around here, right? But nobody really talk about it. Is it because people don't care? Probably not. Maybe it's because people are uneducated? Probably. Or maybe people just don't know how to go about it. But how do people come through and create solutions if you don't talk about it? Can you? If I'm thinking the same thing and somebody in this crowd is thinking the same thing, how am I supposed to know that he's thinking the same thing unless I tell him I'm thinking that or he tell me? There's no way. Right? That's why it's important to talk about these things. Because if you don't talk about it, how can we come to a solution? Just like my mother was crying, worried, sick, didn't know where I would be for days. She would be checking the morgue. She would be checking the hospital. She would be checking the county roster. Right, to see if I'm either locked up or in jail or I'm, you know, I mean, I'm in a hospital or I'm dead. Every single night I'm gone, there's probably hundreds of mothers in your community dealing with the same thing. And man, you know, the messed up thing is we all complacent. Because what are we doing? Right? What are we doing? Man, I understand probably everybody, a lot of people here are probably young, you know what I mean? And this is all food for thought. I'm not trying to guilt trip nobody. This is just a perspective, right? And this is the reason why conversations are important because we're not all the same. I might speak about something and have a completely different perspective that might change your mind or vice versa. Somebody might say something that would change my whole mind and how I look on things, right? And so that's why it's important. We're such a loving community, but sometimes, due to survival instincts, you know, we can turn very irrational really quickly, right? We live in a country that's very individualistic. Growing up, you see any country outside of Western countries, very communal. It takes a village, right? So when we come to America, it's every man for themselves. But is that right? Whether it's as a Muslim, as a neighbor, or just a human, right? How many of y'all probably go down the street and y'all see another brother or sister struggling, right? Addicted, going through it, probably posted up. Call him a junkie. Oh yeah, he's just a crackhead. Right? Or whatever name you may call them. How many of y'all are in the masjid, grew up in the masjid, and you say, oh yeah, yeah that, that brother fall off, we can't be around him no more, that sister fell off, we can't be around him no more. Right? We say, al-marru ma'adini khalili, you're the religion of your friend. We can't be around this brother no more, we can't be around the sister no more, because they're off the path. They're not practicing no more. They're down this street or they're doing this now so we can't be around them. Right? So, why I'm telling you all of this is because as Muslims, it's our duty. Hello? It's our duty. Can y'all hear me? Okay. It's our duty to help one another. Right? You're going to be asked, you know what I mean, on the day of Yom al Qiyamah, when you see somebody struggling, you're not doing nothing for them. There's a whole story about a, a person who was practicing 
a religious person, prayed every day, worshipped Allah day and night, who his whole community, his whole community was disobeying God. They were going down this path. And Allah sent down the angels to destroy them. And they asked, well, this is, there's this one person that's worshipping you. This one person that's, you know, obeying you. How about him? And Allah said, destroy him amongst the people because why? He didn't do nothing to help them. He didn't do nothing to show them the way. So you got to cut that superiority complex because that's what's destroying you. And a lot of times, most, most of the people that are doing that are only doing that because they're insecure themselves. You probably have something you're insecure about. It's probably something, somebody that you was jealous about back in the day when you was a kid and you're looking at them and now you see them laid out and you're like, yeah, yes. You know what I mean? Because that's something that people, people are like. So like, you got to really think, how can you help one another? Because people are dying and it's happening everywhere. And this is not to make nobody feel guilty. This is not to make nobody, you know, feel bad. This is just a reality. Because we bury in people every single day in all of our respective communities. Every single day. Fentanyl is the leading cause of death for anybody from the ages of 18 to 45. Do you know how crazy that is? It's a new drug that's only been around youth for like the past 10 years. The past, it's the leading cause of death. People are dying every day because of it. And so, we have to have these conversations. And it doesn't have to come from me. Because even though y'all my, my community, y'all Somali, I love y'all, y'all Muslim, I love y'all. I'm not from Columbus. There's probably people here that are like, damn, I don't even know this nigga. Why am I speaking to him? Why am I listening to him? Right? It has to come from you. It has to come from your community in order for y'all to help each other. Somebody has to take that initiative. Somebody has to stand up and be a leader. Right? And talk about that. Because if you don't, people are going to continue dying. And this is not to talk down on nobody. This is because it's a real thing. There's probably people here that know somebody that was struggling. And it kills them inside because they're dead and they can't come back. And that's just a fact. Because I know I felt like that. Right? So how many people do you know that are struggling right now? How many? One, two, countless, hundred. There's so many. Probably people you grew up with. Probably people you cut off. Right? And again, this is not to guilt trip nobody. I'm just giving you facts. Because this is a reality in every respective community. All around. Somali or not, Muslim or not, you see this everywhere. Right? So I'm just giving you a perspective. Because my perspective, I grew up in the masjid. I finished the Quran. I grew up in the, the Duxi system. Graduated high school. Went through all of that and I still fell into this, you know, situation. Right? And I was shunned. Ain't nobody want to mess with me. You know what I mean? There's a, a famous neighborhood for Somali people where I grew up in, it's called Cedar Riverside. Every Somali person passes through it. You have to, because it's right in between. If you live in Minneapolis, it's an intersection for all three highways. That's why so many people know it, because you pass through it always, if you live in Minneapolis. There's a strip right there where most people be posting up, and I used to be posted there every day. I went to Duxie across the street, went to the community center across the street. My mom used to work there at the community center. Everybody knew me, right? Not a lot of people helped me. But I don't put it on nobody because a lot of people are just uneducated. People don't understand it. People are like, yo, why does, why does dude always ask me for money? Like he broke or something, right? Why is he doing this? Why is he doing that? Why are you asking why? Because you don't understand it. So maybe 
learn from somebody. Do some research. Talk about it. Because if you don't talk about it, you'll just be ignorant. And you know what ignorance breeds? Arrogance. Arrogance is what kills, right? Especially to those who are practicing, right? Because you know what Allah says about arrogance, right? And so we got to stop this, you know, holier than thou, higher than thou superiority complex. Um, yeah, man, I just, I'm just going off the fly here, trying to just let y'all know how I feel and just give y'all some game, you know? I'm not here to tell nobody don't do drugs. I just want to let you know that. And this is not to tell people do drugs. I want you to understand what I'm saying, right? What I'm saying is that every person has their own ability to do whatever they want to do, right? But I'm just giving y'all the game to understand, right? That everything that happens, it has a consequence. When you neglect somebody, it has a consequence. When you help somebody, it has a consequence. When you choose to do something, it has a consequence, whether it's positive or negative, right? I went through something called withdrawals. Does anybody know what withdrawals is? So I did something negative, what happened with it? Consequence, right? So when you go through withdrawals, right, it's when you stop a substance that you're addicted to. It can happen to anything. It's not just substances like drugs, like, you know, pharmaceutical drugs. It can happen even with, you can have caffeine withdrawal. Did anybody know that? You drink Starbucks every day for the sisters. I know y'all be drinking Starbucks every day, right? When you stop, what happens? You get the headaches, the migraines, right? That's why everybody's drinking chai now. Because they don't want to get the migraines. And so, it's something that people go through, right? And it's something that I went through as well. You know, you get sick. You can't eat. You can't sleep. You're throwing up. You know, um, and a lot more. I just don't want to get too deep into it because maybe y'all just had some lunch. It's very explicit. But it's very painful. And it can last anywhere from like a couple of days to even up to a month, depending on how addicted the person is to the substance, how far they're, how deep they're in, into it. And so um, I'm going to go a little, uh, what's the word, segue into another thing that I do, which is poetry, right? So I've been writing poetry since I was 13. And something that, um, that I've been doing a lot over the past few years is sharing my poetry that's recovery related. It's about my experience with my addiction and my recovery, right? And so it just gives you a little bit of insight into my life. So this first one that I wrote, it's about, it's about withdrawals. It's, it's about a time in my life where I was going through withdrawals. A um, little backstory to it. I got sober June 16th, 2019, right? Which is, isn't too long ago. I've been sober for about three years and uh, one month now. And so like, with my life, when, my, when I went over there, I, went, I didn't go through any regular treatment facility or anything like that because I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what treatment was. I didn't know that there was medications like Suboxone or Methadone available to people to help people with their withdrawals. I didn't know what Narcan was. I didn't know that, um, you know, all of these things that are helpful to somebody that, you know, is going through addiction. I didn't know about any of these resources. And so what I did was I called my mom and I told her, Hoyo, I need to leave, you know? I was dealing with a lot of stuff, not just only drug related, you know what I mean? And um, it was a point in my life where I just seen death creeping at my, at my corner. And a lot of my friends were dying around me, so I just needed to leave. And so my grandma stayed in Harlem, New York, and I stayed over there with her for about two and a half months. And during that time period, I went through the withdrawal process. My grandma, right, she's my mom's mom's sister, oldest sister. So, you know, we just say, yeah, yeah, but it's great aunt, right? She brought most of my family here. She came here in the 70s. I stayed with her, she didn't know anything. So my whole time, my mom was telling me, yo, just stick in the room, but I'm sweating, I can't sleep at night. You know what I mean? I can't eat the food, my grandma's cooking me food, I can't eat it. And it was a, a rough situation because I was just in isolation for you know, weeks on end. 
And so this is a little bit about this, uh, um, just that experience. Sleepless nights filled with fright, filled with ache and loss of might, filled with sweat and cold shivers, filled with pain and it rarely withers. Enough pain to demoralize a man, hard to count the time, yes, hard to withstand. The pain that one feels as he lets go of what he loves, hard to understand the withdrawals from drugs. Be that as it may, it's possible to listen so that one could try to understand what it's like to be imprisoned. Perspective is subjective so long our stories have been neglected. For so long, every addict has yearned to just be respected, only to be rejected. Submissive to society's concepts, acceptive of its labeling context, every addict believes they're worthless due to society's superiority complex. Objects. They just see us as tokens of conquest. Tokens of opportunity, they just see us as prospects. I'm sick of it. Back to scheduled programming, sobriety and society, happy smiles to keep them smiling. Everyone loves a happy ending. But is it truly progress? When I get a, I'm so proud of you for changing, but disgraced if I tried but died in the process. Cold sweats. 90 degrees, but I'm shivering, this is a bold step. Reminiscing why I started, I'm flustered with regret, secrets. Battling within myself, I'm steady on defense. It's me versus me, but I'm restlessly weakened. Am I weak then? If I'm losing but trying to repent? Seeking to change my ways, but it's harder to reset. Let me reset. Let's go back to our roots. No more running from these problems. It's time to face the truth. Wasn't the brightest kid, or at least that's what I was told. Maybe I was smarter, but I believed the dream that I was sold. Or maybe I was good for nothing. Maybe I had it coming. Or maybe I was a kid acting out. I didn't see what I was becoming. Maybe I was cursed to freak accident by birth. Accepting that I was an embarrassment made me feel like the worst. Faced tribulations since I was young. Is it part of who I become? Maybe I started problems because it's the only thing I could get done. A troubled child since a pubescent. I remember fights as an adolescent. My past wasn't the most pleasant, but I didn't understand that until the present. Mama was really struggling. Six kids, single mom hustling. I remember lights out every other month, sleeping in the living room, never wondering. Playing with the candle. In and I'm trying to find the meaning, my thoughts are often fleeting. Withdrawals aching, my body's shaking through this pain, I'm learning patience. Through my anger, I'm starting to break, and if I'm not mistaken, breaking points often birth recreation or destruction. I'm reluctant. My body isn't that toughened. The plugs calling my line saying he just re-upped it. It's luck. No, it's fate. I must make this mistake. I can handle myself just one more taste. And after that, I'll start this process after today. I'll change. I just need some time. And the process goes on, so I often get stuck in time. And when I don't, my heart and mind usually fight to take us my side. It's like a never-ending cycle. But I'll break it in due time. Just one more high. Just one more time. The fleeting thoughts of an addict's mind. And so, thank you. And so that poem, uh, I wrote it speaking on the perspective of somebody going through withdrawal because it's one of the most awakening moments for a person when they're going through that. Because you're going through so much pain. Let me ask y'all a question. Who ever crashed their car? Who, anybody ever crashed a car or crashed their car? I, how, tell me about the experience. Don't you just think about everything that just happened? Like how the hell did how did I get into this position? Because everything just happens so fast, right? And it could just be not just crashing your car. It can be any, you know, experience where it causes some type of detrimental stress, right? You start going through. You just start thinking about life. How did you get into this position? Where did it come from? You know, and just start. You just filled with so much regret. And so the withdrawal period is a little like that. Right, and you're just thinking about how you got into that position, which is a hard thing to grasp, you know, because a lot of people think that addiction is a choice, you know, and it may start out as one. You might start out as just trying to experience something, you know, you may just start out as like out of peer pressure, but you don't really know the truth of the, the, the reasoning behind your actions. Everybody, do you, everybody thinks they know themselves, and, and that's the scary thing about life. 
I'm 24 years old. Have I ever lived to be 24? Except for this month? Nah. nah. Do I know how it is to be 24? No, I'm living it. I'm just winging it. Everybody's just winging it. You don't know how to be 27, 26, 25. You're just winging it. You don't know what you're doing, but you think you know what you're doing. And that's why we make mistakes. And the worst part about it is that when we make those mistakes, we think we're better than somebody else that makes a mistake. Because it's a different mistake than what we made. Right? And so, understanding that and understanding where you came from and understanding why you do the things that you do, how your childhood affects you is all different things that people need to understand in order to move forward in any aspect of life. And it doesn't just have to be just with addiction. It can be anything, including mental health, which is so stigmatized. Man, even when I was in recovery, I used to deny going to therapy. I'll be like, man, that's not, nah, you know, like I, I remember my brother used to try to convince me because he, he was the first one in our family to go to therapy. You know, and it was, for him, it was court mandated. And he took me, he tried to take me to his therapist. And I went there one time and it was after my close friend had died. And I went there for a day and I was like, yeah, man, I'm not doing that. But as time went on and the grief went on, it just got, it got too much. Right? And it can feel like that sometimes. Right? How many of you guys have lost a loved one before? It doesn't have to be to addiction. Just any type of loved one. Somebody you love, they're not here no more. Raise your hand. Right? And it can be a lot. Now how do you deal with that pain? Now, when we look at our community, how do we deal with things? Man, we just winging it. Because what did our parents do? They were just winging it. They came here, what, 20 some years old? Had kids, came from war, traumatized. That's generational trauma. We didn't know, they didn't know how to deal with what they were going through. So we didn't know how to deal with what we were going through. Right? They didn't have the same outlets as us and maybe that's why we're so susceptible to drug use, maybe. Hmm? Maybe that's the reason. Because we don't know how to deal with trauma. We don't know how to let out our emotions in a healthy manner. We don't know how to cope. Right? But you wouldn't know unless what? You talk about it. Right? And so I'm going to open up the, the audience to, to Q&A or whoever wants to speak. Or I just, uh, yeah, let me know if anybody has any questions. Let's get practical. <laughs> that is my boy Muhammad. He runs a podcast. He does this a little bit. It's like, it's like let's get practical. Tune into Go Talks. It's an amazing podcast. Um, but, uh, I mean, there's a lot of different ways, right? So for me, myself, right, therapy was very helpful for me. Um, going to the gym, having a support system, talking about it. Holding things in is what really, like, is what really messed me up a lot throughout my life. You know what I mean? I got you. Just give me one second. And, um... That's what something that really messed me up in my life is just holding everything in and just bottling it up. Because sooner or later, if you don't speak on it, your body will act on it. So you'll find a way to cope, but you don't even know it. You know what I mean? You try to run away from your problems, which is something that I do still. There's different ways where I try to run away from my problems. One thing I try to do is I, I travel a lot, which in a way is me running away from my problems because I don't want to talk about it, I don't want to deal with it. You know what I mean? It does help me, it's a little therapeutic, you know what I mean? But at the same time, um, facing my problems and processing them, processing my emotions in a healthy manner is something that could take a long time, you know? So talking about it, seeking professional help, therapy is not just for kids, it's not just for old people, it's not just for white people, right? It's for everybody and it works. I'm here to tell you it works. Um, and so, yeah, connection. And, um, him and his boys, they all got locked up. And I remember um, that had really affected me a lot because they were like the only people I had around me for real that I could really connect to. And my homies didn't really understand all the stuff that I was going through as a kid because I was going through a lot of stuff from around the age of, um, yeah, like, since I was a kid, you know what I mean? Until like growing up in high school. 
and I didn't really have nobody to emotionally connect with. And my brother and his friends were really people that I really connected to and looked up to and they were there for me. And um, when they was gone, I just tried to be around other different people. Um, and I remember um, I was out too much. I was partying, kicking it. Um, and it was my last year of high school. And I remember the week after I graduated, my mom kicked me out. You know, I was just doing stupid stuff. I walked to the door, my sister uh, gave me the, uh, the trash bag full of my clothes. I said, you know what I'm saying? Hoy said, I can't let you in. So I said, all right, bet. And so I went trapping it for like a month. And during that time period, I remember it was like, for a good period of time, like I didn't let that affect me throughout the whole time. And it was bit by bit, because I remember like all my friends were smoking, you know? So in the beginning, it was just like, I will just be around it. Then they would be in hot boxes, and first I would leave the car. Then I would just sit in the car. I'd be like, nah, it's all good. Y'all can go ahead and smoke. You know what I mean? And then I remember one day I was just like, you know what, let me, let me just try it. And uh, it was just out of curiosity, honestly. But I remember in that moment in the high, I liked it. And it wasn't, the dude that I smoked with wasn't somebody that I was close to. Uh, I had an ex-girlfriend. And her, her close friend, the dude she was dating, I was with him, you know, and we weren't really close, we were just close because the two people that we were dating were friends. And so we were with each other and there was a lot of stuff going on in my life and I remember he was just smoking and he just, he passed it to me and I was just like, you know what, why not? I smoked it. I hid it from my friends for like, I think a couple of days and then I just went up to them and I was like, you know, yo guys, I smoked. And they got mad at me because, I mean, like my homies was already smoking and they weren't, they weren't the type to ever try to influence me, to try to just keep it away from me. So when they found out that I was smoking, I mean, like I'm a grown man, they were just like, oh damn, why you ain't smoke with us? Why you smoke with that dude, you know? So I remember I smoked with them and um, these are like really close homies, we all grew up together. And they looked at me and I remember one of my homies, Khalid, a really close friend of mine, he was the one, he, he actually dropped me off at the airport earlier today. Um, he told me, he was in the back of the car, he's in recovery too. He told me, he was like, Abdurrahman, because I was just tweaking out, you know, like a first experience, somebody high, you just tweaking, you know, you're just laughing, and so it's a real experience. And he told me, he said, Abdurrahman, if you're smoking just to have fun, by all means, bro, see you here, chill out, do whatever you want to do. You know, and the, the reason why he's telling me this is because he knows what I'm going through. He knew my, like, I didn't really tell people around, like, other people that I just met, like my senior year, I was, people didn't really know what I was going through. But these, these close homies of mine, they knew. And I remember he told me, he was like, Rahman, if you're smoking, just have fun, bro, have fun. But if you're smoking to run away from your problems, like, stop, you know? And I remember in that moment, I realized, like, damn, I'm not really thinking about what I'm going through. I'm just kicking it, you know? And after that, every day after that, I just started smoking just to, like, you know, not think about what I was going through. And it just time went on, and I remember it was like, that was like, like 2016, June, and went on, and like a couple months later, I started doing Xanax. And then my homie got shot in October 2016, when he got out of the hospital, and so he was with us, and when he got shot, and, we, and he got out of the hospital, he was at his crib, and we were staying at his crib, and so he ended up getting Percocets. And so I started doing the Percocet with him, you know? Um, and then soon, like a year later, it turned into fentanyl. And my first time trying fentanyl, I OD'd, but uh, the high was completely stronger. It was like way more stronger than what I was doing, which was Percocet. And so I just started doing that on and off, and it just became more of that. It's what I kind of rolled with and until about 2019 when I stopped. Yeah. You talking about like the homies that I used to do the drugs with and stuff like that? I mean, some respected it. And some would kind of feel it some type of way, but I feel like the reason some dudes really felt some type of way for real was like, they really were just trying to keep me, they, you know, like people will support you so long as you're not doing like good or better than them in a way, you know what I mean? And it's not to say you're better, I'm better than anybody, but it was just the way that I was stepping out of that crowd. Some people kind of like felt some type of way, and those were people. Those weren't people that I was super close with. Most of the people like that were like people that I just hung out with, and we only connection that we had with each other probably do drugs. You know what I mean? We just kicked it together and stuff like that, and they would just be like, "Oh yeah, yeah, you act in Hollywood," or you know, like, "Oh damn," you know, something like that. 
uh, and I remember when we first started this organization, you know, when we didn't really get like, uh, we weren't a legitimate organization until last year, but before that we just kind of just did the work in our community, host events, you know, do what we can for, the, for two years. But in that process, I remember there would be people like, you know, just with different allegations, they would just be like, oh yeah, man, you, you're just trying to get money. You know, are you trying to do this? Are you trying to do that? But a lot of, a lot of those falling outs, I feel like had more to do with, you know, I did something that they weren't ready to do. You know what I mean? And that's, that's something that comes with growth. And it's no love lost. I mean, like, there's still the homies, like, some of these people, like, that I'm talking about are people that would, like, come up to me and apologize to me or they didn't understand it until they got out of it. But it's like, I was really somebody that you would see on the street and people would be like, yo, this dude bummed out. Like, he's a bum. You know what I mean? Like, for real. And people that know me can attest to that. So I think it was just, it's a hard pill to swallow when you know a dude that used to be on the streets, laid out, you know what I mean, and, you know, was really bummy, you know, is now, like, you know, trying to get his life together, and you're not, you're not doing that. And so I feel like, but they, they, I had a lot of friends that supported me. I had a lot of people that supported me. I had a lot of people from my community that supported me. I had a lot of people, you know what I mean, that I, that I knew, you know what I mean, because I was the only person from the neighborhood, from the area that's affected the most, from the people that are doing this stuff, you know what I mean, that are talking about it and then letting people know, and not just people that don't do this, but also people that do do this, letting them know, yo, you can stop this too, because we used to really feel boxed in. Like, damn, yo, I'm trying to stop. When I got sober in uh, June, June 16, 2019, I started that journey actually a whole year before that, you know? And I started it in 2018, trying to get off, uh, like, at first it was just the streets because I got shot at a lot. My homies was dying, and I was just trying to get out, and I ended up moving somewhere in called Duluth. It's like three-hour drive, trying to just get out of that area. And I would be like, man, I'm just going to kick it. I'm going to just, you know what I'm saying, well, do whatever I can, smoke my weed, work, and that's going to keep me away from that life. But it didn't work out for me, you know what I mean? And so when I came back to Minneapolis, I was trying to get sober. Like, I was like, you know what? The drugs are not for me. This is what I got to take care of. And I continued on with that and trying hard, trying hard, trying hard to stop. And it took me about six months. Six months of trying. Six months of dua. Six months of praying. Six months of continuous, you know, tr trial and error in order for me to get it right. But even then, like, you know what I mean? There's so many people that have been trying for years, you know? And so helping people, providing the resources. So for like the past few years, all we've been doing is just establishing base within resources and that's what's needed in our community. And something that's really messed up with the Somali community is that we, there's a disparity in resources. People don't know about this, but the reason why people don't know that we're affected this bad is because people don't talk about it. You know what I mean? People don't go to the government and be like, yo, we need funding for, for, to help people in this community. There is no culturally inclusive treatment centers or rehabilitational centers in our community, and that's something that we need. You get what I'm saying? Because they don't, no Somali person gonna go to a white guy and, and, and you know, listen to him. They need people that are Somali that are gonna help them, people that are black that are gonna help them, people that are from the community that are gonna help them, that understand them. You get what I'm saying? And that's why in the beginning I told y'all, yo, listen, I'm just here to spare facts. You don't gotta listen to me because at the end of the day, I'm not from this community, you know what I mean? At the end of the day, I'm Somali, we can have that connection, but that initiative has to come from people from this community because y'all all know each other, you get what I mean? And so, I mean, to answer your question and to add more, yeah, I feel like it just, some people, yeah, some people support, some people didn't, but it just comes with the territory, you feel me? I think that people confuse help Right, with somebody like, I'll give you an example, right? So you have a homie that's doing drugs, you're trying to get him off of the drugs, right? But what you don't understand is the substance use is only the scratch of the surface. You get what I mean? That's a problem in his life. But why is he doing it, right? Where is it coming from? What's going on with him, right? A lot of times we try to take care of the the issue, if I got a garden right here, right, and I see a weed in the ground, right, and I just cut it from, like, cut, it, cut, the, cut the weed out and I don't pull it from the root, what's going to happen? Another weed's going to come out, right? So when you're looking at a problem, you have to deal with it from the root, right, the foundation. 
So when you're looking at somebody that's dealing with substance use, substance use isn't the biggest problem in their life. There's probably other problems that they're dealing with. They probably just need support. You know what I mean? You probably was distant. With, I'm not saying that this is the case, just hypothetical, right? But this is a, something that happens a lot of times, right? Because I get ca you know, calls or people ask me these questions, right? And you want to help a loved one. But how close are you with them right now? How often do you guys talk? How, how, much, are, how much time do you guys spend together? How much do that per does that person trust you, right? Which are all things that are variables into if you're, if you're even viable to help them. Because how, how can that person, how can you help them if they don't trust you? How can you help somebody who ain't talked to them in five years? Right? Man, I remember my uncle called me, right? This is like um, a year ago. I got a little cousin, you know what I mean, who's going through something similar. My uncle called me, he said, Yo, Abdurrahman, uh, you know, I want you to help your cousin. Man, I ain't seen this nigga in 10 years. How can I help him? Right? We haven't spoke. He moved to a completely different state. And my uncle just see me say, yo, I want you to help this kid. And I'm like, yo, okay, there has to be some. I can't just go up to somebody and tell them, yo, you need to stop doing drugs. Right? Does that make any sense? You understand what I'm saying? There has to be that connection. And you have to understand that those problems, there's probably something that's underlying. And people, don't, they only see things at the top surface issue, but there's something under that needs to be solved. You get what I'm saying? Which is a big problem because we're just, you know, and the thing is, it's, it's just people, we're just very logical, you know what I mean? Straightforward. So we look at this, like, this is the problem and this is, you know what I mean? But people don't understand most of the time there's underlying issues that they probably just need some support. They probably just need somebody to listen to them. They just probably need a friend. You know what I mean? And it's not something that happens right away. Man, I got a family member that's been struggling for two and a half years. Sober, went back to it. Sober, went back to it. My family started to give up on him. Worried. But why, though? Why are they so worried? Why are they giving up? You know what I mean? Because they're like, damn, this nigga don't want to help himself. But that's not true. He's trying. He probably trying. He just don't know how to. And it's hard for him not to. You know what I mean? So every person got that rajj in them, they got that hope in them. You just gotta be patient with them and understand that everybody has, like that's their decision to make. And you can't force somebody to do something. But what you can do is just be there for them whenever they need that. You know what I mean? Yeah. We, we try, you know, like it's kind of different because I'm young too, you know, I'm 24 and so like, there's some parents where they're like, yo, we'll come with Dali Karam, Ham, Huri Sheikh, you know what I mean? So I, I, can, I, can, I can have this kid, like, he, he, could, he could be my son. How can I listen to him? But a lot of times with parents that have, like, kids or, you know, a loved one that's going through this, they're more susceptible to listening to us, you know what I mean? Or we try to refer them to professionals that are a little bit older, you know, that can talk to them. Another thing is, you know, like in that also causes, you know, a little bit of a disconnect. But uh, it, it works, you know what I mean? And we actually just made a project released uh, earlier this month called Hoyajalkil, which is a story about my mom. It's my mom's perspective on how my addiction affected her and how she went about it, you know what I mean? And that's been really helpful to parents. But um, I think that Every parent's situation is different, and a lot of parents, they have that same logical thinking, you know, like, yo, like, I remember I got a call from, and it wasn't even a call, it was an email from this parent, you know, and may Allah help their, uh, you know, their kid, but they, they, they sent me an email, and they said, yo, they said, they said, assalamu alaikum, um, they sent me a, uh, a, a, an address, and they said, assalamu alaikum, we want you to go to our son and make him change his life. I'm like, yo, what? You know, and make him become a better Muslim. I can't make the man do nothing. You know, so like, I think they just don't understand how it works. But that's all based on miseducation, the lack of education surrounding this stuff. There's so many parents that they're, they don't even know their kid is addicted to a substance as deadly as fentanyl. And they wake up in the morning trying to wake them up. And they're dead. True story. This is true story. This is what happens in a lot of Somali households and a lot of Muslim households all around the world. They don't even know, right? 
a lot of times it could be because you know there's not that conversation or they don't feel comfortable to talk to their parents about these things it could be a lot of things maybe the parent knows they just don't know how to go about it but all of this at the root of it is just there's no education right people don't know you know and you could be like you know super like uh, pessimistic and say like you know there's google there's the news but no right because even there's parents that won't listen to me well we have to go to misajid and tell them hey we need you to host this so parents can understand it from you guys because they listen to y'all they won't listen to me you know what i mean so it's like just though all of these things are just things that as a community conversation needs to happen it's not something that can just happen with one person one person can't lead it right it takes a village understand so yeah